That's right. You're into just talking. And our guest is award-winning filmmaker Hassan Oswald, currently live in Iraq to discuss his latest documentary film, Higher Love. How's it going, my friend? Hey, and uh, yeah, so I'm very dark right now because uh, we just had a blackout. But, I was like, uh, what just happened? <laughs> you, were, you had good lighting. I was, yeah, I was like, you were just on like for the pre-show just to get us all warmed up. But you know what? This is what makes it kind of interesting. Wow. You know, you, what, you, did you just yeah. light a candle? At least you have internet. Usually the blackout yeah, for so us, that would be gone. No internet for us. Exactly. So we connect the Wi-Fi to the... Uh, to the to the generator so we have we have uh throughout we, we're gonna have wi-fi but uh it might blow up light wise <laughs> and then uh i might be in dark but uh well, hopefully not yeah. for 25 minutes <laughs> well hopefully well, we might as well get this uh interview going because i'm sure a lot of people are wondering you know because my first thought hassan when i was talking with you is like you're not exactly the first person i ever thought i was ever going to talk live on air from iraq uh, and what are you doing out there? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. Uh, so we're just wrapping up my, uh, my second feature. It, it's about the Yazidi genocide. Uh, just briefly, the Yazidis are a uh, ethnic minority who have suffered uh, probably 100, 150 years worth of persecution. And uh, the West, the, the very little news that made it to the West would be... Um, so when ISIS swept through in 2014, they obviously were very brutal to everyone, but they took the Yazidis as sex slaves and uh, captives. So there are still 3,000 of them missing. And uh, the film follows the uh, reuniting of one particular family as, uh, as kind of the world stands by and we try to reunite for children with their two parents. Wow. I mean, you know what this kind of reminds me of? Is this kind of like a similar situation that you see in northern China and how they've been dealing with the Muslims up there? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it has similarities. Uh, and I, so I just returned. I'm in Iraq now and I just returned from Syria this, this morning. Uh, it has similarities as far as uh, what I can film and what I can't film and what I, while I am filming what I can film, what I am willing to risk. Uh, but uh, so yeah, in China, so it's the Uyghurs and they have a lot of, um, I, I won't get into it. Uh, there we go. Hey, uh, and the lights on. are back on. Yeah, oh. back on. <laughs> so uh yeah, so they have um, that that deserves a documentary or, or, or 20 as far as what's going on in China with the Uyghurs. Um, and I, you know, I, I just returned from Syria and I always, always fear for uh, the content. Like, what, what am I getting? What, what will, who will stop me from filming? Who will, um, you know, potentially... Uh, you know, I'm an American journalist. I'm a target. So who will potentially yeah. lock me? Um, so yeah, that was a really big issue as I returned from Syria and as I hopefully continue to film in Syria. Um, but with the Uyghurs in, in China, uh, that will be. But like, let me ask you this, like Hassan, like how does someone like yourself get involved in a project like this? Because like I said, I mean, you are an American citizen. The last thing I would be thinking about is a filmmaker ever wanting to risk his life to get, you know, infiltrate on a level an ISIS encampment. I mean, how is that experience like? Yeah, so I would say like uh, it's surprisingly easy for uh, really? someone. Really? To for someone to tell this story so, oh like there there's no heroic any, anything in this um i you know i'm self-taught i learn everything i learn editing i learn cinematography on youtube uh i started my first film higher love uh in camden new jersey and i always tell my friends that you know there's not that much of a difference between what i feel at fear wise in camden new jersey as what i fear uh, in Syria and Iraq, which is, mm. you know, that's, that's a commentary on what's going on in South Jersey. Uh, I, 
you know, I, I learned things in, in Camden, New Jersey that made this film possible. Um, I, I learned how to approach people. I learned how to uh, talk about things that maybe uh, the viewer would see as things shouldn't be talked about, whether it's opioid epidemic, whether it's, uh, you know, dealing drugs, whether it, whether it's where I am now, the, uh, but my thing is though, when I'm, uh, but I, to me, it doesn't seem like the same thing as filming in Camden and compared to going to an ISIS encampment, because like, do you even speak a lick of Arabic? Yeah. You don't speak any of it. So how does someone like yourself even get anywhere near close to getting inside those camps. I mean, uh, my heart is kind of racing, even kind of thinking about it right now. And I mean, I don't got the cojones that you have. I mean, you were kind of telling me certain things that kind of allowed you to kind of bypass and do it. Uh, could you kind of explain that with the listening audience, some of the different tactics that you had to use just to be able to get inside those facilities? Yeah, I mean, whether it's so, yeah, just recently I've been in the ISIS camps and, uh, but I would say it's very similar to what got me into the trap houses and drug houses in Camden, New Jersey. Mm. Um, I met them where they were. Uh, I didn't have a budget. I, I went there and asked, would you help me tell your story? Whether it's the opioid epidemic, whether it's uh, where I am now, the missing Yazidis or uh, what's going on with ISIS in, in this part of the world. What um, drew you to um, go for the Yazidis and tell their story? Because I actually follow a lot about the Yazidis. That's one of the things I was very fascinated with. Uh, a lot of people don't know their religion also includes reincarnation amongst their yeah. community. Um, so to me, it's very fascinating. So what drew you to it? Yeah, so uh, my first, so I was an English teacher until 2016. Uh, my first kind of uh, foray in documentary film, I went to the Greek islands where uh, the Sir when the Syrian civil war was happening. And uh, I, you know, I met so many amazing people and the people that stuck out really, really to me were the Yazidi people. And I had never heard of them. And I had traveled a good bit. You know, I had worked in the field for two years. Um, so I just immediately was attracted to that story. And at that time, I didn't know that I knew about the genocides. I knew about what happened with them, but I didn't know that there was 3000 of them still missing. Wow. Yeah, mostly female, mostly females because they're sex slaves and then the children. Wow. Exactly. So when I heard that, I, I knew that this was, if I didn't know about this, being you know pretty, pretty familiar with the region, I knew that the world you know needed to get eyes on with the fact that there are 3000 or 4000 Yazidi slaves still missing in captivity with ISIS. And I get that you meet these kind of individuals out on the street in Syria and Iraq, but like you were telling me that you, you kind of went undercover and posed as an NGO medical doctor. I mean, how do you make that happen? Because I, did you hide behind the mask? Because you were sort of telling me before the show, it's like the wild west in Syria and no one's wearing a mask during the pandemic. So how does someone like yourself, Hassan, get in there i still want to know because you don't speak arabic <laughs> what, is that the only tactic you use is poses yeah. some, okay it, it's like uh so no yeah no one wears masks i mean adding this the covid situation is adding a wrinkle that i never ever would have anticipated yeah. the whole last year uh in the middle east especially where um you know there's not a lot of regulation there's not a lot of protocol so yeah, uh, we went into these camps, uh, and I won't give too many spoilers, but um, we went into these ISIS camps uh, disguised as things we weren't, whether that was, uh, you know, uh, a medical COVID doctor, doctors, <laughs> or, or or whatnot. Um, I went in with an amazing, yeah. So I went in with an amazing team. Um, access is so so tricky there but uh yeah it was very tricky and even more tricky because of what we we're going through with COVID. have you had any uh life or death situations while you're out there oh uh yeah so uh <laughs> just recently i think since we've we've talked chris it's uh 
we went back to the the ISIS camp Al Hol, and it's it's been well covered. So it's it's been known as the second caliphate right now. Mm. Uh, and so while we were there, uh, there was two stabbings of undercover people who were trying to do things we were doing. Um, two of them died, and uh, it's yeah, it's wow. very very. I, I wish I could describe what it's like. So people say, like, why can't you know where these Yazidi women are? Why can't you find them? Uh, and I felt that as well until I went there. It's it's not a needle in a haystack. It's it's a needle in an ocean wow. uh, at, at best. Wow. I mean, uh, and you did kind of mention about how you were out there. COVID-19 kicked in. Yeah, you had a that was another kind of factor that you had to play in. I mean, did you feel any kind of cinematic pressure or the kind of travel restrictions when it came to, you know, working on this film right now? Yeah, I mean, so uh, the travel restrictions at first were bad. I mean, I got locked in to Iraq for four months, but at the same time, uh, I, we were stuck with our story, which was a blessing in disguise. So. You know, I know that so many productions came to a screeching halt as far as borders, as far as uh, where you can film and when. Uh, and we didn't really have that issue. So we were filming in the Middle East. They locked down pretty early, which got me stuck, but they opened up pretty early. So we've been able to travel to uh, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, uh, pretty much without without a uh, restriction so it's is the key to have a dual citizenship <laughs> i was just about to you say, know, say I, I, that like, the... I don't know about an american <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean you, you, like i said you stick out like dog dick red out there i'm just saying you know if you had a u.s citizenship that's just the extra lottery bingo out there uh, that's why i fear for your life man you know is that kind of a key thing out there right now as a filmmaker it, yeah it's certainly helpful i mean just Turkey. A lot of this takes place in Turkey. Uh, and I, okay. I fully, I fully uh, expect to no longer be allowed in Turkey after this <laughs> film. Uh, but, and yeah, Turkey, banned. And <laughs> banned. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Turkey was the, the, our biggest issue as far as lock, they locked down early, but they opened up early. Uh, and as you said, I have a, a dual citizenship. So Italian passport has been uh, absolutely amazing, except for when I get stopped at the militia checkpoints and they ask Oof. me my favorite Italian soccer teams. And I'm like, uh. <laughs> so you started to learn a few of the A, B, and C. Exactly. That's crazy. Yeah, because well, Italians know their football. Oh, yeah. Yes, like they do. Sports, there is no getting around that. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Well, let's let's switch gears because I know your latest film, Higher Love, it's it's obviously about heroin. And I don't know if you know this, but Oregon decriminalized small possession of heroin and meth to be a hundred dollar fine or the option to choose therapy. Do you believe this to be a radical move? Not at all. I mean, I've been waiting for this. So we we, we started. Oh, our really? Okay. Yeah, well, we, we started our film. Um, I've traveled a good bit for, for film and before my film life as an English teacher. And uh, I had already thought of the Portuguese. So Portuguese had decriminalized, like they're, I think, 11 years on what they oh. did. Um, so when I went to Camden and went to uh, Philadelphia, I always wondered when this step would be. Mm -hmm. When can we decriminalize? So in small steps I saw so Camden criminalized uh fair, fair needle exchanges they criminalized uh things that in my opinion would be progressive um so when I saw what they did in Oregon that was just you know, well, how many uh, addicts would actually take the therapy I mean when it's a hundred dollar fine you would think people would just skip it you think a lot really a lot yeah. Wow. And Chris, I, I'll, I'll tell you right now that they, the, the clean needle exchanges, they shut down Camden because they weren't official. The uh, fair use, like what you can do to avoid a, a criminal fine, a felony, as far as possession, uh, that should have started so long ago. And yep. I'm so happy to see what Oregon did. 
Yeah, I agree because, you know, it's not like Oregon is not going after the dealers, the people who are pushing it. Um, they're saying the people who have a problem are the ones yeah. that here's a way to get help versus throwing you in jail for that week, that, you know, two weeks, the three weeks. And when you're in jail, you're detoxing. There's no medical help. Um, right. you, can, you can die in jail. I was, when I was in jail, the woman with, that was thrown in, she was coming off heroin and I forced them to get her medical help. I mean, it well, was that's a good question right bad. there. I like that point, Marissa, because let me uh, let me jump to this, because my first thought when I was watching your film, Higher Love, why would an individual trust you and a film crew to help save this person from kicking this addiction instead of just calling the Camden police? Yeah, I mean, that's super, super easy to answer. Uh, this is a this is Camden, New Jersey, but this could also be uh, Flint. Michigan. This could also be Detroit. This is not Camden. This is forgotten USA. So the the police, you know, we know the America knows what is going on right now with, uh, you know, whether it's defund police, whether it's uh, refund certain parts of the police. This is not a it was never a political statement. It was never a a, a, a watch this film and and, and see what happens like as far as uh changing political the political landscape this was a human project this was i will go and see the human effect of the opioid epidemic this is i will go and see uh something through the eyes of a city that has been forgotten for decades yeah and it, it's it's camden new jersey but it, it's like i said it's not camden new jersey it's it's all these forgotten post-industrial post yeah. forgotten cities. Yeah, um, Iman, one of the people in your film that you follow, he had the best line in there where it says he's lived in suburbs, rural cities, and no matter where he goes, heroin is there. Heroin yeah. doesn't care if you're rich, doesn't care if you're poor, doesn't care about anything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, taking over your life. And I thought that was the essence of it for me, that film was that this is not just Camden. But I, you know what? I, I hear higher love, higher love. I love that name. W why that title, Hassan? Yeah. Uh, so actually, just touching back on the last point, the, the, our working title forever and uh, it, like almost till distribution was uh, Below the Brine. So mm. Below the Brine is a poem by Walt Whitman, who's from Camden, New Jersey. And it's about a, a world that exists below the surface of the ocean, below the brine. So we, we approach this film as something, not only a forgotten city, a forgotten people, but a forgotten post-industrial USA. So it could be anywhere. So we wanted to dive into this, this story that no one's paid attention to forever at least 60 years, 40 years, 60 years since the, the factories fell. So we started out with Below the Brine. We're gonna show you what happens beneath these, uh, you know, you pull up to a gas station. Yeah. You, you, roll up to your win you roll up your windows because the scary man is showing you uh, a newspaper and vinegar to try to clean your window and you're scared. <laughs> and I know yeah. that because that was me like I went to Villanova University right down the road from Camden. Uh, I, I, the area I grew up in, you know, you roll your windows up when you go to Camden. But you um, know what? Let me ask you this because I know you were like, you know, there's certain scenes, you know, and I won't give too much away because you got to see the film to see the effect it will leave on you after seeing higher love. But is there a, like a limit or certain things that you like? I, my thing is how could you stay silent there is some crucial things that you see human individuals are doing to themselves, which is basically harming their lives. How do you stay silent during those, those moments? Yeah, it was tough. And uh, like I made the decision very early on. Um, and as I said before, I was, this was my first film. I didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't know the, uh, uh, the morality of a documentary film shoot. I didn't know, uh, the legality of a documentary film shoot. I went with my gut. Uh, so I 100% would step in when 
if you've seen the film, the baby was in danger. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I made that decision very early on. And there, you'll see scenes where whether it's boiling water or the little kid going up the stairs or uh, things like that, I, I would have and did step in. And I have no problem breaking that fourth that fourth okay. wall. Of, uh, I saw that in the stairs, actually. I saw the baby cr- um, climbing up. And I was like, oh, my God, there's a lot of stairs. The dad's not there. And the next thing, the shot, he's at the bottom. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah no i mean that's that's the thing because i mean you do see certain scenes with a pregnant woman injecting heroin and you think my god are you gonna really start filming that or when do you start to interject and is there like a do you sign i don't know how that works i mean i've never shot a documentary to the extent that you have been i mean is there certain contracts or is it just by a word of mouth code that you just don't step in or yeah so like i was lucky enough that because I had no budget, I wore all the hats. So whether that, that was producer, uh, uh, cinematographer, or editor, I very early on made the decision that while I would, you know, observe whether that's a fly on the wall type, type, type style uh, or, you know, more of a late, like a reserve filmography type of situation i i immediately knew that i had to sh- let them do what they would do normally do you regret that decision do you now yeah 100 yeah, percent. i'll be honest with you uh there's a lot of things that i carry with me until this next film mm. um as far as what happened and what if i was a a you know not holding a camera versus trying to help these these characters uh it's yes what were some of the lessons you've learned from higher love that you brought into your latest project currently in iraq is there something that like really stuck with you from your directorial film that you knew that you wanted to do better or didn't do the first time that you definitely wanted to do this time around yeah oh 100 i mean just just, I, I mean, I, that was my first film. So I had no idea about uh, lenses. I know about ISO. I know about sound. Sound was yeah. amazing. So just like uh, from a technical aspect, uh, what a disaster that uh, higher love. Uh, <laughs> well, you get so, them walking off, right? And then you're going, I can't get have, them. I need a wireless mic. <laughs> we have we have a yeah. trailer of it, too. Do we have time? Yeah, to let's play a trailer? trailer real quick. We got a little quick snippet of it. And let's show the listening audience uh, higher love. And you would think they wouldn't sell to a pregnant person. They don't have no heart, no compassion. If I die, I die. I just don't want to go to hell. That's dope city, man. I don't think this is going to be a happy ending. I told him plenty of times, find somebody better than me. I'm not good for you. I'm poison for you. But he doesn't listen. I'm going to keep on. And this time, I mean it. If I don't make it, I'm going to die this year. I mean, it, it hits you. And, you know, you you did say this earlier in this interview, but I also noticed that you had this on your website for Higher Love. And you were saying that Higher Love isn't a film about raising awareness about politics and policy. Then what is your message then? Human. It's, it's, it's no one wakes up uh, one day and says, I want to live in a gutter in Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they, there was steps that caused that. So I would like that, you know, you're not going to leave this film with, a call to action, which is, you know, against normal norms for a, uh, uh, a documentary film. I would right. like for you to leave this film and say, I'm going to be a little bit more patient with these people. I'm going to be a little bit more patient with these cities. I'm going to be a little bit more patient when that person comes to my window. Um, that's, that's what we set out to do as far as seeing this opioid epidemic through their eyes. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of issues in America. and Well, I mean, what would be your call of action? I mean, on the top of your head, what would you like to see happen? I mean, you, I mean, you said Oregon's a good thing. I mean, do you want to see the rest of the nation start to decriminalize heroin? And you actually think that that will actually bring change to that community? 100%. But I would say the call to action is, is 
be patient with these communities, be patient with these post-industrial lost USAs. Don't write them off. Mm-hmm. Absolutely agree with yeah. you, man. That's that's some good stuff, man. And everybody, you got to go check it out. It's on every kind of streaming service that you can think possible. This is award-winning. Got to remember that. Award-winning mm-hmm. filmmaker, Hassan Oswald. Thank you again for joining us on the Chris Collins Show, Millennial Thank Talk you. Show. As you're in Iraq right now, as it's 9.36 p.m. over there, we appreciate you. And thank you again for joining the show, my friend. Thank you guys so much. All right. Keep in touch, brother. And safe travels.